Good to see you all. Um, this is Allison Backus Troy in my latest video for The Shared World, my um, channel on the humanities in real life and in everyday life. I am filming for you today inside my car <laughs> because I have had a pretty busy day of errands and putting some different things together and just life. And I really wanted to put something out for you all today because it's been a little bit since um, my last poetry reading. And so I wanted to just have something done and put out for you all. Um, what I wanted to share with you all today is um, a short essay, very, very short, from my favorite, favorite poet, who is Jane Kenyon. I love Jane Kenyon. I have loved her since my undergrad. Um, I did a lot of writing about her nonfiction work um, when I was in grad school. And if you haven't read her poetry, you really are in for encountering somebody whose life and presence was just... Um, so remarkable. Um, she died a couple decades ago from um, leukemia and her husband was the very famous poet Donald Hall who um, uh, wrote, you know, he, he they both were really uh, well-known American poets. They got married, they moved to a little um, house in New Hampshire and had kind of this idyllic poetry life together. And one of the things that's really remarkable about, remarkable about Kenyon is that she was very open in writing about her mental illness. Um, she had really um, manic depression. Um, one of her most famous poems, which I'm not going to read here, but which is a really wonderful introduction to her work, um, is the poem Having It Out with Melancholy, in which she kind of has these various dialogues with her um, depression medication, with her surroundings, with her encounter with this ongoing illness in her life and it's just remarkable it's just such a well done poem so if you're looking for a poetry way to get introduced to her if you haven't been introduced to her already that's a really wonderful one probably her poem that might be the most familiar to people is her poem otherwise which um is uh just like a shorter poem that i think gets circulated a lot but um this is some of her nonfiction work and what i love about her nonfiction work is that i really think that poets make the best nonfiction writers. They really do. They have such a strong sense of image and line and um, this benefits nonfiction writing so much. And I think that um, her nonfiction writing is just really remarkable. The book is called A Hundred White Daffodils. Sorry, the sunlight's kind of in the way. <laughs> um, but it's just a collection of like essays and interviews. And one of the things that I really love that she did in her life, which I think is a really wonderful example of the humanities in everyday life, is that she um, submitted columns for her local newspaper just about life and about her observations of their home and the seasons. And that's part of what I'm going to read to you today is one of these shorter essays that she actually submitted in her newspaper, like in her local newspaper. So, um, Part of the reason I wanted to share this essay is that it's November and it's continuing on with the fall and I'm still continuing with the series about, you know, poetry, readings connected to the fall. And so even though this is prose, it is written by a poet. And my friend Phoebe shared this really wonderful um, um, bit on Facebook the other day about how November is really like her favorite month in fall. And now that I'm living here in Houston, November is definitely a different experience for me because this is kind of like when the weather starts to actually chill out and it's not a million degrees outside. But for Kenyon, November was um, a really intimate kind of month for her. And there's a line in this essay about how November and the colors of November in her New England surroundings were really like the colors of the soul. And and um, I, I feel like this is just a really another another really wonderful example of fall writing that is um, connected to the season and also connected to these deeper associations that we have with the season. So um, I'm going to read this and then I'm going to go do car pickup, <laughs> school pickup in the carpool line. Um, this essay, which is short, is called Goodbye and Keep Cold. Um, and what I'll do when I share this is that, um, I mean, you could just find this on Amazon, your local bookstore. This has been, this book has been out for a long time. My copy is very marked up because I, um, studied this a lot in grad school, but it's, it's easy to find. So goodbye and keep cold. The gloomiest garden chore I can think of is preparing the perennial beds for winter. The golden days of autumn, when chrysanthemums and asters still bloom, and a cricket or two still chirp in the long, lush grass that needs mowing one more time. 
Those apple fragrant days are gone, replaced by days when the ground never softens but remains gray and buff and dry and hard, the ruts in the frozen drive seemingly turned to stone. By now the mower is back in the barn, empty of gas and of life's noisy possibilities. I cover it with a tarp against bat droppings. Garden tools lean in the dark shed, everything idle, the raking and transplanting done. Our revels are now ended. In October, we cut the flower stalks to the ground and cart away the refuse. The undiseased stalks we pitch onto the compost pile. Those flecked with mildew or black spot go over the edge of the ravine behind the barn, the horticultural equivalent of an automotive graveyard, the end of the line. Asparagus stalks rattle with the dryness of bamboo when I cut them down, a mournful sound. We gather up armfuls of long, strap-like leaves of Siberian iris, moist, reddish peony stalks, woody hollyhock stems taller than I am. We lay bare the crowns of the plants and let them freeze deliberately. Now that the ground is hard, perennials locked into the earth, it's time to mulch the long beds with chopped up leaves and a top dressing of manure. Over it all, we put cut boughs of pine to keep the brown coverlet in place, to keep the ground frozen, not to keep it warm, so that a mild spell won't tempt the plants into growth, only to be killed by the next cold weather. My red-haired stepdaughter, Philippa, who majored in plant science, explained to me that the alternate freezing and thawing of plant cells, expansion and contraction, bursts the cells, producing what we call winter kill. Robert Frost wrote, No orchard's the worst for the wintriest storm, but one thing about it, it mustn't get warm. How often already you've had to be told, keep cold, young orchard, goodbye and keep cold. Now the last leaves are down, except for the thick, dark leaves of the oak and ghostly beech leaves that click in the breeze, and we're reduced to a subtler show of color, brown, gray, and buff, perhaps a little purple in the distance, and the black green of moss, hemlock, and fir. To my eye, these hues are more beautiful than the garish early autumn with its orange leaves, orange the color of madness. That line has always stood out to me, These this description of the super vibrant uh, October leaves and then the muted November ones. And leaves the color of blood. Let hot life retire, grow still. November's colors are those of the soul. Thanksgiving, with its reliable bounty, its reunions, its hours of perfumed air, is over. Not for us yet. <laughs> and the raking, the planting of bulbs, and the digging of root crops are finished for the year. The freezer and pantry shelves are as full as they're going to be. What we have done, we have done. And what we have left undone, we have left undone. Silence and darkness grow apace, broken only by the crack of a hunter's gun in the woods. Songbirds abandon us so gradually that, until the day when we hear no birdsong at all but the scolding of a jay, we haven't realized that we are bereft, as after a death. Even the sun has gone off somewhere. By tea time, the parlor is as black as the inside of a cupboard. Reading after supper on the couch, I let my mind wander to the compost pile, bulging with leaves and stalks. I've turned it a few times since October, but the pile's hard surface no longer yields to the fork. Even the earthworms have retreated from the cold and closed the door behind them. There's an oven warm at the pile's center, but you have to take that on faith. Now we all come in, having put the garden to bed. We wait for winter to pull a chilly sheet over its head. I love her. I just, I love her work and I love this essay. And as we prepare to enter into the, um, the quiet, muted parts of autumn, wherever you are, um, I hope that this essay resonates with you and that you're able to hear in the rhythms of the seasons your own need for laying things down letting things rest, keeping things cold and still, um, not as like a weird metaphor for your life, but like, you know, as something to listen to and to lean on as we journey through this season. Um, I hope that you are well. I hope that you stay well. I hope that no illnesses have reached you, um, as they've reached many here in Houston. And, um, please continue to keep watching my channel. Thanks so much. Bye.